Good evening, everyone. And welcome to the Dharma and Justice Dialogue series from the Thich Nhat Hanh Program for Engaged Buddhism at Union Theological Seminary. My name is Kosen Gregory Snyder, and I am the Senior Director and Assistant Professor of Buddhist Studies here at Union. Tonight's conversation is on Black Buddhists and the Radical Black Tradition with our speakers, Dr. Rima Vesely Flad and Dr. Tony Presley Sanon. Their conversation will explore themes of blackness, gender, and sexuality within Dharma practice and communities. Engaging the work of Black Buddhist teachers, our speakers will together examine the distinct contributions of contemporary writers, as well as luminaries such as James Baldwin and Audre Lorde, whose essays clarify historical teachings on suffering, impermanence, compassion, and sensuality. This will be an engaging conversation for sure. So in the interest of time, instead of reading the bio for each speaker, I will put a link that includes their bios in the chat for your reference. And to my colleagues, I do want to welcome you both. It's a joy and honor to have you with us. I want to extend a double welcome to Dr. Vesely Flad as she will be joining the Union faculty this coming fall as the visiting professor of Buddhism and Black Studies. It is good to be with you both, and I very much look forward to hear this conversation. So I turn it over to you. Thank you, Greg. Hi, Rima. Okay, thank you so much, um, everyone, for being here. Um, I'd like to start by um, offering us a moment of silence to come into the space together, um, just to let us arrive properly. And, and so I will ring a bell um, and we can just sort of sit and feel each other's present presence for just a moment. Um, and then you will hear another bell, which will signal for us to come back into the space together. Thank you. So first I'd like to thank Peace to CJ and Union Theological Seminary for inviting me to be in conversation with Dr. Rima Vesely Flad. And thank you, Rima, for this kind invitation. I'd also like to acknowledge those on whose land I sit, the Anishinaabe people that is today known as Ypsilanti, Michigan. And I'd like to acknowledge those on whose shoulders I stand, ancestors both known and unknown, non-human and human, who make it possible for me to be here with you this evening. Um, and I'll turn it over to Rima. Thank you, Tony, it's such a an honor to be in conversation with you this evening. And 
I also want to take a moment to recognize the lineages from which we come, uh, biological and spiritual lineages. So first to honor the Buddha and the many, many disciples over centuries who carried the teachings forward so that we could today access them. And also to honor indigenous peoples upon whose land we stand and to honor the um, tremendous uh, teachings those indigenous peoples brought forward and to acknowledge the genocide and the displacement. And lastly, to honor our own biological and spiritual ancestors and to invite them into this space, the people who have been our teachers, who have been our inspiration, who have been our systems of support. So with those words, Tony, it's such a pleasure. And I, I just wanna say by way of introduction to this conversation that Tony, I think was the first person to read the book once it was published. And so, um, and by that, I mean, I'm not totally sure this uh, just came out. I'm not good at this. This just came out uh, last week and Tony uh, read it and commented on it and really was my first interlocutor. I'm wondering if we can put the title into the chat and, um, and I can do this also at the end of the conversation, uh, just say a little bit more about how to access the book. But the book is called Black Buddhists and the Black Radical Tradition, and it's subtitled The Practice of Stillness in the Movement for Liberation. And so uh, Tony is a perfect conversation partner in large part because you've had a chance to digest it and to critique it and to um, offer me some feedback. So thank you for that. Yeah, it was my pleasure to read it. I couldn't wait to, um, to dive into it. Yeah, I had a, uh, before I, the book actually came out, I had the pleasure of reading some proofs, which were really, which was uh, um, an amazing gift. I'd head over to Starbucks with my chapters and, <laughs> and my bookmarks and um, was just fascinated by all of your insights, all of the history that you give, um, how you let the words of those um, that you interviewed shine through. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really such a pleasure. I was so honored to, um, to be asked to um, be part of the reading and the responding to it and um, now with this, so quite a gift. And I will say that being in conversation with you is a gift to all of us and to those of us who can't be here um, to be able to read it at a, if not already, because it came out on the fifth, then in the near future will also be a gift to them. Um, I feel like this, this offering is a gift to the world, so. My, my total pleasure. Oh, thank you. I, I will say, and you know, I have my own critiques, of course, but reading uh, the quotes, having done the interviews and then rereading and rereading and editing, and, and just to say this um, for those of you who haven't yet had a chance to access it, that it contains interviews with 40 Black Buddhists primarily teachers, some are long-term practitioners who are not uh, either ordained or identified in their tradition as teachers, but they've sat for well over a decade, sometimes for many decades. And then it includes the voices of 31 additional Black Buddhists through Dharma talks, blogs, uh, published writings, various um, works that are accessible online. And in marinating in these voices for really five years. I was just uh, in contact with Reverend Angel this morning and she was my first interviewee on April 17th, 2017. So this book was five years in the making and 
for me personally, as someone who was really kind of at the margins of my tradition, I sit in the insight tradition, it was really quite profound to feel like I had to practice myself in order to really understand what these teachers were saying, that it wasn't enough to read, it wasn't an intellectual conversation, that it really was um, a depth of practice. And it mattered to actually deepen my own and have a deep sense of concepts such as no self, or even an investigation of intergenerational trauma my mm -hmm. own. And so maybe that is something we can delve into. What, what is the importance of this tradition, particularly for people of African descent living in this country? Yeah, um, I think that's an important question, but I also, uh, I'm also curious about um, how you came to um, how we came to Buddhism, right? Because I, re I remember looking on YouTube and there's actually a channel that is actually called Black People Don't Practice Buddhism, right? <laughs> um, and uh, I think that this is something that Bell Hooks talked about a lot, um, that she would often be asked, why Buddhist, right? Um, and so um, I, I want to go back to kind of an origin before we kind of go forward and how we got to this place. Um, and then I think as part of that, we can think about what it does for, for um, uh, why Buddhism, Buddhism is important for people of African descent, yeah? What do you I think? I think that's a great question. I, I'm not totally sure they're very separate because I do think Black people in this country came to this tradition because of deep suffering. And it strikes me that for many, many practitioners and teachers, there didn't necessarily, it still doesn't need to be a disavowal of, say, the Christian tradition and the Christian church, that mm -hmm. for many, there's a kind of merging of the traditions and practices. But within the Christian tradition, there weren't necessarily teachings and practices of turning towards suffering so explicitly, so directly. And mm -hmm. so it strikes me that the conversation on intergenerational trauma that surfaced very organically in the interviews is really what led folks to encounter Buddhism and at the same time, as I say that, I wonder if some of what you're thinking about is just the fact of how Buddhism came to this country and slowly how Black folk were able to access the teachings. Mm, yeah, um, I feel like that's, that's an important history, I think. Um, but I'm more interested in um, thinking about the way that um, it impacts our experience in the United States or black people's experience in the United States and how it um, has been adopted and adapted and interpreted by people of African descent um, in this country in particular. Um, I think there's a particular kind of suffering, right? That um, people of African descent um, experience that um, Buddhism addresses in um, a particular way. I would say that's true. And I would say that some of what has come up in research, and I would say this personally as well, is that there are really important teachings on, say, causes and conditions. Sometimes this gets translated as dependent origination, but it's really this teaching that our suffering comes from somewhere. And I think this is really important and beautiful in this particular um, context to say, to acknowledge that yes, our suffering does come from somewhere. And it's actually not just because we have thirst or desire, but there is socially driven mm -hmm. suffering and our tradition can explicitly acknowledge it. And then there are teachings on impermanence. And part of the reason those teachings are so powerful, and I'm especially thinking of a teaching of the five aggregates and the concept or the teaching that, that we 
have, we consist of mental formations that are unstable, that are always changing, but are very powerful and lead us to form habits and lead to conditioning, mental conditioning. And when we can turn towards those sometimes unconscious habits and patterns and conditioning and really see them, but also see them for unst as unstable, we know that we have the capacity to change them. So I think Buddhism really does offer us ways to deconstruct white supremacy, to deconstruct our suffering, our conditions, and then to say, um, this is how I've been conditioned and here are some practices to turn towards that conditioning and to heal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, and um, I, Anatta or the concept of no self is something that I have struggled with for a very long time. And <laughs> uh, you and I have talked about this um, and, and you've written about this really eloquently, how um, kind of vexing that concept can be for people of African descent whose bodies have been um, so, um, dehumanized and attacked and um, um, so much violence has been um, visited upon our bodies in this, um, in this country. And so it's, when people say it's, it's, there's no self that may bring up all kinds of issues around but this is my experience. How do I put this experience aside? This is um, this is my this is the source of my suffering, right? Um, and Buddhism, if I'm understanding Anatta correctly, can help us um, not spiritually bypass, right? But actually, um, by tapping into impermanence and the the five aggregates and the fact that everything changes. Um, not be um, caught up in um, those relative experiences, but also be able to access the absolute, right? The, the larger than um, those experiences, um, reality of our existence. Yeah, I definitely think that, that there's so much freedom in this teaching on impermanence, the impermanence of our own selves and the impermanence of all phenomena, mm -hmm. all reality around us. And it can be very scary for sure. But what I find really profound about this teaching of impermanence or the sense of inherent instability is that it also means all of these narratives from the dominant culture are not rooted in some mm -hmm. kind of permanent truth that those mm -hmm. narratives too are unstable so yes this is my experience and we can only discover freedom by delving into our own experiences and everything we've been taught to believe as stable as as a kind of greater truth also can be deconstructed and i think that is tremendously liberating mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the chapter that you have where you um, interview all these different teachers about the concept of non-self was, um, it's one of my favorites. I mean, all of the chapters are my favorites, but I love, I really, really love that one. Again, because it is such a, um, a big thing for me, um, you know, walking around in this body, this black female body um, in, um, in this country. And one of the things I loved and which I didn't expect was the way that you gave space for all of these different interpretations and all of these different voices to sort of come together and not make a, it's not cacophonous. It's actually kind of like a symphony, all of these different ways of, of um, experiencing and thinking about anatta um, or non-self are welcome right in your in your manuscript so i really really appreciate that um and it's one it's, i think it's something i'll go back to again and again um 
when I'm trying to sort of <laughs> sort it out. Yeah, so I really appreciate that. Um, one of the, um, my favorite articles by the Buddhist writer and scholar, Charles Johnson is um, why Buddhism for, for African-Americans now or something like that. Um, so tell me, why do you think um, Buddhism is, is a good path for African-Americans now? at this time? I hear and I also experience that this is a direct path towards turning um, towards our own lives and our suffering and not just focusing on the external world. I was not really expecting this, but there was such an emphasis on healing mm. in these interviews and I as I started to really practice with this book, I also felt that in a very deep way. So, you know, so much of our history, and actually I start off in the introduction talking about the fact that so much of what we identify as Black history in this country is the history of protest and turning towards external institutions and fighting for a sense of humanity, fighting for civil rights, fighting for political power. And there is so much importance and validity to expending that kind of energy and that kind of resistance mm -hmm. because of such dehumanization. Mm -hmm. And I say, and I say this based on my data, based on my field work, that we can't only turn outward, that we have to actually turn inward and turn first towards ourselves and then towards our families and our communities. And part of what I say in a more kind of blanket way is as we focus outwardly, but not entirely, as we also then take some time to focus inwardly, as we start to deconstruct our experiences, as we start to heal, that that opens up a kind of um, addressing of how deep the fractures have been. And I feel like we deserve that, you know, mm -hmm. that white people in dominant society get to take time for themselves. We can too. And I also think that Buddhism allows us to, through various rituals, maybe not allows, maybe fosters is a better word, fosters an honoring of those whose shoulders upon whom we stand, that there are rituals of honoring ancestors that are so important and so central. Yeah. I also think that Buddhism through practices, through breath practices and walking meditation, that we connect with our bodies in ways that are so important. And you know, really what we're taught is that our body, our body is our vehicle for liberation. That is core to the teachings. And so what does it mean then to take this body, this, as you say, this black female body in our cases, but of course, for so many non-binary people, male, you know, male gendered people to take this body that has been so defiled historically, so rejected, constructed as inferior and to embrace it as a vehicle for liberation. And these teachings center that, center that, that expression that our bodies are vehicles for liberation. And I think it's revolutionary to directly and distinctly embrace our bodies as vehicles for liberation. So all of that is so paramount. And, and then the last thing that has come to the forefront, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I started there. I actually started thinking much more about the Black prophetic tradition when I was writing this book and it kind of expanded then to the black radical tradition more broadly. But I do think that Buddhism is that uh, furthering, if not almost, I would say a fulfillment of what we are taught in the black radical tradition with regards to psychological liberation. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. 
quest for independence. There's this emphasis on being independent from white supremacy, independent from dominant culture. Mm -hmm. You heard it with Marcus Garvey. You, you know, we heard it with Malcolm. I mean, Malcolm, the bulk of his speeches were about that, really about psychological liberation, you know, uh, economic liberation, political liberation, all of that was really secondary. He was really focused on how we think about ourselves. And I see and I experience Dharma practice as the way to achieve that. In yeah. a very, and, I, and I do make the distinction between spiritual liberation and psychological liberation. I think they are distinct, but I think within that teaching, in those spiritual teachings, in that practice of of um, the Dharma that psychologically we now have a means, a direct path towards mm -hmm. liberating ourselves from these dominant messages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that um, one of the gifts of this practice is not staying in the space of protest, right? Because that's one of the um, important tenets of, of um, the Black radical tradition, right? You're not just protesting something. You're not a, just against something. You're actually moving towards something, right? The, moving towards this liberation. You are um, envisioning a different way of being in the world. And I think that this, this stillness that you talk about, that you bring up in your subtitle, um, allows us to have to envision beyond the protests, right? <laughs> so that was actually going to be one of my questions. What is the role of stillness in the movement towards um, real uh, social justice, real social equity, um, social, political, psychological um, liberation? I would love to hear your response to that too. I think that's a really <laughs> profound question, but what I would offer is that the role of stillness is the capacity to stop reacting, to mm. be in a space of non-reactivity and how profound it is to see, to experience, to, um, to witness, to digest so much oppression and yet not resist it on its own terms, but rather define the terms upon which we will respond. Mm -hmm. And I do think there is a difference between reacting and responding. And I feel like this practice offers us a depth of capacity to learn how to respond with integrity and not just be in a place of reactivity. Yeah. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts too. What do you think? Um, well, just from an experiential level, um, I would say that uh, probably for most of my life, I was just, uh, you know, blown back and forth by the winds of whatever was happening around me. What people said to me would, you know, crush my day, made me feel um, a certain way about myself. And um after years of practice, um, I'm able to, um, there's an open awareness, right? That this is not one, that this is not all there is. Um, and it, it kind of reminds me of um, the song by Sweet Honey and the Rock. Um, um, don't listen to, um, listen more often to things than to beings, right? So um, not always being in reaction, but being um, very much aware that these delusions that we spend so much time caught up in of separation, of greed, of avarice, um, don't allow us to see um, or to be aware of um, a very, very simple fact, right? That we all just want to be happy. We all just want to live. We all just want to take care of our families. Um, and um, 
So with that in mind, then um, I can get up from my, my little cushion, right? With a sense of expansiveness, um, with a sense of um, my um, interconnectedness with uh, maybe this person I went to my cushion thinking of as an, an enemy, right? And then see them as myself. So that has been um, soup. That was that has been really, really powerful for me. Yeah. And they, um, you know, and this is the thing. It's a question actually that I had for you, but um, it's about coming back to the body. Right? It's about coming to the back back to the body as not separate from the earth, as not separate from other beings, as not separate from the birds outside of your window is not separate from all of these other um, wonderful spirits that occupy our, our earth. Um, and so, yes, uh, you know, <laughs> I still get angry. I, I am still um, harmed. I still suffer, right? But I think that um, this stillness gives me the tools that I need to Um, traverse that kind of lake, whereas once it was an ocean. I guess I would say that. That makes so much sense to me. I can relate, empathize with all of it. Being blown by the winds, being <laughs> feeling that sense of drowning by the waves, and then slowly developing the capacity to turn towards it. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a little bit of a non sequitur and I apologize, but I want to just say that I saw um, the movie Frozen 2 and there's this scene of riding a water horse. And I just thought this is a Dharma teaching <laughs> that, you know, she's like drowning and drowning and then slowly is able to ride this horse that she's mm -hmm. created. And it is that sense of, you know, just being blown over and over and over and then slowly being able to master the waves that come mm -hmm. with a kind of ease. And mm -hmm. I think that is really profound for people, especially who feel very deeply psychologically, um, I'll say battered because it does feel like assault it, and, and oftentimes is real assault. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so coming back to the body, <laughs> Buddhism is about the embodiment. So um, I was wondering, though, as I was reading your, your book, um, and I'm not quite sure how to put this, but um, how did you feel about writing an academic book about um, something that is about embodiment? Um, like, what was that experience like? Did you did you step back for a moment and think, oh, this is weird um, <laughs> to be trying to um, put into words something that can only be in some ways experienced, right? Um, uh, or um, was it kind of one of those things where it was like, okay, I know how much this has supported my own liberation. And given the, the platform that I have, given the position that I have, this is kind of what I need to do. Hmm. Well, that's a great question. I think because I'm trained as an academic and over many years, many decades at this point, I sort of gravitate towards that. Yeah. It didn't really occur to me to write in another way. Of course, mm -hmm. much of the vast majority of books published by Black Buddhists are uh, memoirs or poetic reflections or interpretations of teachings. Mm -hmm. But I really, it's true, I was trying to do something else. and. And I also do not self-identify as a Dharma teacher in a kind of explicit way. I have taught some classes. I have a deep practice. I lead workshops, but I 
I have not been formally recognized in any traditions as a Dharma teacher. Mm -hmm. I didn't really uh, start from that perspective. Mm -hmm. It was more actually responding in some ways to the book Radical Dharma by Reverend mm -hmm. Andrew Kyoto Williams and Lama Rod Owens and Yasmin Saidula. I was in um, many ways very inspired by that book. And so, as I mentioned, my first interview is with Reverend Angel exactly five years ago. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really start with thinking about the body in such an explicit way, but after doing so much field work, I did four rounds of interviews. And so I would do 10 and transcribe and do some writing and then, and, and it really evolved. You know, it became very clear how powerful this practice and teaching of the body, um, how powerful it is. And in the midst of it, I took a course on the Satipatthana Sutta. And that was actually very important, hindsight being 2020, because so much of the Satipatthana Sutta is about working with the body. Mm. And I, it was very hard for me personally. Mm. I just, I would try these practices and find them just very, very difficult, very uphill. But when I was actually able to start settling, I could see that and I could hear these teachings. I'm thinking of people like Zenju, Zenju Earthland Manual, who talks so much about the body. You know, I could actually hear her in a very different way once I started really intentionally practicing, like practicing teachings on the elements and how our bodies are composed of different elements. It was a very hard teaching for me to access. But if I actually committed to it and I was able to do it, then I could, st I could start to hear that. Another important teacher for me is Sebene Selassie, who's a teacher in my tradition. And Seb talks about the body all the time. Mm -hmm. And until, and she actually ta she talks about the elements all the time. And until I was really trying to practice, I just, I didn't really get it. Yeah. So I would say as an academic, you know, in many ways I started off where you have, uh, heard a lot of emphasis, which is on specific teachings that I thought were very hard for people mm -hmm. of African descent to digest. Mm -hmm. but I was really thinking like, what happens when your ancestors have been called three fifths of a human being, then how do you hear the language of no self or non self, it just doesn't register, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. At least it didn't for me. But, but it was, it's true that in the, in the process of researching and writing and reflecting and sitting and coming back, I could hear the depth of the teachings across lineages and see a kind of congruence, hear a kind of congruence. And, and, and then, oh, actually, um, this is something that is familiar to you. And I think something that um, Greg mentioned in the introduction, then it was bringing in luminary voices like Baldwin, like Audre Lorde, and really honing in on the importance for them of sensuality and erotic power. They both talk about it very directly, very explicitly. Actually just finished reading, I think all of Baldwin's nonfiction. I think I have gotten through everything. His speeches, wow. essays, a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of it. He was, <laughs> he was out there. He was, I mean, it's, it's actually very, it's really amazing. But to just delve into, you know, interview after interview, speech after speech, in the way that he talks about, for example, sexual repression as foundational for maintaining white supremacy, mm -hmm. and then how he talks about living into a kind of sensual energy as a liberating aspect for all people, not just Black folk. I think there's something so profound, and we get this in Buddhism, not in all traditions, I mean, but we I do. Yeah, I mean... I, I so, I'm so happy that you brought up Baldwin because I've also been listening to his interviews and, and reading him and it through this, and it, I guess, you know, I had Buddha, Buddhism on the, on the brain, but it was amazing to me just how Buddhist his writing was just this orientation. I, one of my favorite sayings by uh, quotes by him is something about the, the importance of suffering in order to grow up, <laughs> you know, and yes. that's, that is one of the, the four noble truths, right? We all suffer. Yes. And this is what we um, avoid 
for most of our lives, right? This, this suffering that is inevitable. So um, yes, just listening to um, his interviews. I, I don't think I will ever get through all of his writings because he was so prolific. Yes. Um, at the same time that he was out in the streets, um, you know, doing the protesting, doing the um, interviews on Dick Cavett, which I, one of which I shared with my class the other day. And, um, you know, students don't necessarily know who, who yeah, um, James Baldwin is. Um, and I think he's just, he's still so important. And, and I think that there has been a resurgence of interest in his writings. Um, Begin Again, which uh, you uh, turned me on to. And um, there's another little book that uh, just came out. I, remember, I forget the, um, the title of it. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say one thing, which I think really piggybacks off of what you just mentioned, which is that it's in The Fire Next Time, Baldwin says, people who cannot suffer can never grow up. Mm -hmm. And I think that word cannot, <laughs> is so important because he's also then saying people who can suffer intentionally turn towards their suffering, acknowledge it, delve mm -hmm. into it, know it intimately, mm -hmm. can grow up. And he indicts white society for its, you could say juvenile or um, childish repression, this rejection, this uh, projection. He says white folk do not want to suffer. So they project all of that onto black bodies, willfully, intentionally or unintentionally, but the inability or lack of interest in taking on their own suffering is what maintains white white supremacy. And so for a bald man yeah. that can suffer. And he says black people can't avoid our suffering. But I also think he does go deeper. And I think this is what Buddhism gives us is the tools to turn towards our suffering very intentionally and very directly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Suffer skillfully. I love that word skillfully. Skillfully. Um, yeah, I agree. I would also venture to say that um, love, um, the idea of love, and I would even say a love ethic, right? That um, Bell Hooks sort of formally discusses. It was very much a part of um, his work as well as Audre Lorde's work. Um, I would even say Alice Walker's work who was more explicitly, I think she says Buddha-ish. And <laughs> um, actually some of the women that we, we um, studied in a course that I took with you um, last, last year. Yeah. So, um, what do you, what would you say is the, it may sound like a, a really simple question, but I'm, I'm kind of curious about your answer. What would you say is the role of love in liberation? I actually think everything starts with compassion, everything. And it's interesting because there's this practice called RAIN, R-A-I-N, that gets attributed to various teachers and has become quite well known in the insight tradition. And I was just teaching this to a group of parents actually. Mm. And it struck me that the nurturing, the N stands for nurturing and that that's last. And I just think actually we have to start with nurturing first. Mm -hmm. So for me the way that love is lived out is translated and embodied and enacted is really through these teachings on compassion and i actually think to have a deep practice and to work with trauma that we have to start with compassion and cultivating a compassionate voice and one of the reasons I love Audre Lorde's writings is because she identifies the importance of mothering ourselves. She's very clear that we have to do this for ourselves. We have to take this on, that we can't look to other people to give us what we want, but we have to cultivate that maternal voice within us. Mm -hmm. I think that's so powerful, but how do you do it? And I think Buddhism and the compassion practices and in, in my tradition, which is, you know, as I mentioned, the insight tradition, it's so important. We actually 
wish loving kindness and we start with ourselves we start yes. by saying mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. may i be peaceful may i be safe may i be protected you know may i be strong may i have ease and well-being and i will be honest and say when i started sitting in 2006 in this tradition i had sat in a zen tradition for about a year prior and i had learned how to meditate in the tradition of titnat han's lineage but when I started in the insight tradition and started saying these phrases on a retreat, a retreat for people of African descent, or actually no, it was people of color, broadly speaking, mostly black folk from New York City were on that retreat. But I couldn't really imagine what security and safety felt like. It was, there was such an incredible void. Like, may I be safe and secure? And I was like, I have no concept of what that feels like. I couldn't even imagine it. It was years before I could really have a sense of safety, a deep sense of safety in my own person. In the years of sitting with these phrases and saying them and turning towards them, even when I didn't really feel them, yep. I do think starting with ourselves and then and then in this practice, we extend it. We extend it to a benefactor, to someone we don't know, like a neutral person, to someone we struggle with. And you mentioned this also earlier, to someone we may abhor or completely reject, someone who's caused tremendous harm. Mm -hmm. But we learn how to start with ourselves. And for me, that is the practice of love. And then we extend it outwards. And I do think for Black folk, especially those of us who come from church traditions, that community and sangha is so important. And I don't know how much it gets emphasized in predominantly white sanghas. My experience is that it doesn't get emphasized very much, but my experience in black Buddhist circles is that it's central. And that too is the work of love or the practice of love, the being of love. Yes. Yes, and that's been written about a lot, the, the kind of difference between um, sanghas of color and predominantly white um, sanghas in which um, the beloved community is emphasized rather than one's own personal um, liberation apart as separate from the community, right? And um, It's a, it's a kind of different orientation that might have something to do with that, with that um, Black religious tradition. Um, I would also say, though, that we see it, this sense of um, my liberation is um, inextricable from my community's liberation in the slave narratives, right? Like Frederick Douglass's slave narratives. And... Um, uh, I forget who wrote um, Narrative of the Life of a Slave Girl. Um, uh, Harriet Jacob. Harriet Jacob, yes. So you, I mean, all of them, you get this sense that while, and, and Harriet Tubman, who went yes. back and yes, got who went back people, 13 times. Threat of death, right? Yes. There is no liberation. There is no in individual liberation without the whole liberation of um, the community, which is, I think, why um, so much of what we've seen so far from the um, Black Buddhist community in terms of writing is, is memoir, right? And, um, you know, these personal narratives, um, it's part of that long tradition of uh, writing, not only to express your own liberation, but also showing the path to other people. It's almost like, a, um, it's like a, a light just along the way to the path. If you, um, I don't know if you've had a chance to read Spring Washam's, um, oh, I forget the name of the book, but it's, a, it's this beautiful uh, little um, memoir and she, she, basically walks us through her own um, suffering to get to her liberation and totally, you know, along the way, invites the reader to, um, um, to join her on this path. And yes. she's also doing a book about Harriet Tubman. So, <laughs> I mean, it all comes, and this is also what Buddhism does. I mean, or the, or the stillness does, is it allows you to see all these wonderful connections, past, present, future, breaks down all of these um, 
delusions of time and limitation and, um, you know, this writing of the constitution. I was listening to an interview that you did earlier and you were talking about the fact that um, in the original constitution, uh, people of African descent were considered three fifths of a human being. How do you liberate yourself from um, this kind of etched, right, in history, this designation? Mm -hmm. Yes, so Spring's book is A Fierce Heart. Yes, thank That's you. That's what I'm remembering, A Fierce mm -hmm. Heart. And yes, I think she and so many others and actually, I'll just say this for the audience because um, I think I feel like I'm always looking to find these resources. That I have a website, and I'll put it in the chat. It's uh, BuddhismAndBlackVoices.com, and there's a resources page that is, I think, comprehensive at this point. That has uh, all of these published writings, including Spring Washam's book, mm -hmm. and. I think Spring, in talking so personally, and so many of these other writers really do open up to a deep, a depth of rawness, and also say, this is what has happened. This is the trauma that has been enacted on my body, on my life. And this is how I was able to turn towards it mm -hmm. with so much courage. I mean, these voices are so incredibly powerful. Yeah. And so, yeah. right, that dehumanizing and, and also the ways in which our families are so deeply fragmented so often and mm -hmm. the ways in which, you know, all of these writers, these teachers have been able to turn towards that fragmentation and turn towards their family suffering. And yeah, and I think that the part of the power in what it is that they're doing is it allows people like me, right? Or, um, you know, a single mother in Detroit, for example, to also see themselves as part of this community, right? And, and imagine um, their way out of the causes and conditions of their own suffering, right? I think that that is also part of the liberation for me um, because, as a, an academic as well, I sat, but then I also wanted to read. I wanted to, I wanted to know who else was doing this. I wanted to see other people who looked like me doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm so grateful um, for these um, Black Buddhists who are reading, who um, I think you, you've mentioned that there's a new crop of Black Buddhist teachers who are coming through places like Spirit Rock. And so they will be actually sitting on the, on the days, right? Actually teaching and um, giving Dharma talks and leading meditation and ushering in um, those who will come, be, come after. Mm -hmm. Yes, how as we... As we talk, Kanda Basin and Amana Brumbury Johnson and others are leading a women's retreat and they are holding the space. Yes, <laughs> yeah. it is happening and it is so important. Mm -hmm. It's that embodiment, as you've mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess we should mention that Amana actually did the beautiful sculpture that graces the yes. cover of your book. I'm absolutely. <laughs> in love with that yes yeah I feel I mean I put the book on my altar for no other reason than to be able to look at the cover image yeah <laughs> it's very powerful yeah and I it's know. holding the space right now the sculpture is in the middle of their meditation space right now oh yes 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 <laughs> mm. so I guess um my Final question for you is, um, I know that you've been involved with social justice work for a very long time. Um, and so um, I guess I wanted to ask, how has your um, relationship with Buddhism supported your social justice work? Mm. 
and vice versa. Mm. You know, really, this book is written, at least when I first started writing it, it's written for vanguard activists. I was thinking especially of communities in Ferguson, the young people who were outside of the police station for basically a year and a half every single night. And I was, well, at that time I had, I was a parent of a young child and not living in Ferguson, although I did go out a couple of times, but I was someone who lived my work and it was work on dismantling the penal system and I did it for many 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 years and I went through cycles of burnout repeatedly I did actually some enduring damage to my body speaking of bodies Mm -hmm. by that relentless pace so you know in many ways I support I identify I um, wholeheartedly admire I would say this, like a younger um, generation, not always in terms of age, but just people who are out um, protesting and protesting the police state. And, you know, as someone who gave my life to that work for so long, I also in some ways want to say, let there be um, space for you to rest Mm -hmm. as well and I think that commitment to rest in the midst of pushing so hard is so vitally important for us Mm -hmm. and when I say that I mean people of African descent broadly that you know we came of age hearing songs like we who believe in freedom shall not rest and there is a kind of relentless push against the oppression that denies us personhood that especially damages our children mm. where we can see that feel that you know we we uh, resist that wholesale but in giving so much of our energy to the movement movements plural and not taking time to rest mm. i think we can do a different kind of damage that is then internal to ourselves, to our families and our communities. You know, in thinking of Baldwin again, Baldwin talks about the importance of rest and I love him for it. I, I really hone in on that particular teaching from him because I think it does say you have value over and above what you do, but in who you are and it's important to be able to rejuvenate. It's important to be able to come back to your own heartbeat, to the movement of your breath. Right. So mm-hmm. I, I really encourage Vanguard activists to have a kind of balance. I think there will be many more um, wholesome and healed dynamics within our activist communities, which can be very difficult spaces because people are exhausted. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's also when we have time and energy and space to vision so that we're not just trying to knock down the wall in front of us, but we can also start to say, this is the kind of society we want to live in. Mm-hmm, 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 this is where mm-hmm. creativity comes, but right. we have to we have to find ways to replenish. Yeah, in order to dream, you've got to sleep, right? I mean, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great saying. <laughs> I agree. Um, yeah, and just thinking about that, I've heard uh, Reverend Angel talk several times about the importance of rest, of taking care. Um, of activists taking care of themselves. I've heard Ruth King also talk about um, how she has seen so many activists dying on the vine. She uses that that term. And um, though she is not Buddhist, I read uh, Patrice Kahn Cullors, one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement, talk at the very end of her memoir, um, when they call you a terrorist, that she has finally understood the importance of rest, um, taking time with her family and and taking care of her body. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's, yeah, that is 
look up the nap ministry if you have not <laughs> seen it. <laughs> a very important movement that is going on. Um, and yes, I agree. Be out there in the streets, um, but also take time to rest and dance and uh, sing. I mean, one of the things that I thought found really beautiful during the George Floyd um, movement uh, protests uh, two summers ago was that these young people would be out here in their masks doing the electric slide, right? <laughs> in the middle <laughs> of protesting. There was there was space, space for joy, mm. which um, Bell Hooks has also talked about the importance mm. of joy in these movements. So important. Yes, so, so important to be able to um, be with our loved ones and be with our hearts, right? And be in community and share food, which is also so important to the African-American tradition. Yeah, um, yeah I have so many questions. I mean, there's so many things that I <laughs> want to talk to you about around um, this beautiful book, again, that you have offered. And um, I feel so humbled and so grateful that I've been able to spend some time with you Likewise. in this beautiful community, even though we can't see people <laughs> right <laughs> now, we feel you there. Um, and so I guess now, Peace or Greg, are we opening it up to questions or I don't know, Rima, if you wanted to say something else? No, I think this is a good time for questions. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'll, I'll just, yeah, want to thank you. Like I just, yeah, thank you for this conversation. It really has been beautiful. And, Hi, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'll invite in this first question, bringing us back to the body. Um, so this person is asking, when you say bodies as vehicles, does that suggest a separation of body and self um, or whatever language you would use? Can you speak more to that? Yeah, I think I was the one who initially used that and I'll, and I actually use it a lot in the book. So I'll uh, speak directly to that, which is um, another way of saying our body as the container of um, our being. I am not using it in such a way of um, implying separation as much as maybe a, a way of saying this is where we are housed. This is the place to which we return. I don't know if that makes sense. Maybe that's too metaphorical, but it's, it's really um, this teaching and this practice of becoming deeply aware of the rhythms of our body. So for example, in a sitting meditation, instead of uh, being so focused on the chaos of the mind, there's a practice of simply coming back to following the breath and then the mind you know erupts and we say there is the chaos again and then we attune to our breath and what's so amazing in that particular practice of breath meditation is that we are following we're not mm. leading we're not asserting we're not charging we're not actually in charge our breath is just naturally coming in and out of our bodies and if we can slow down enough to attune to that and the rhythm of that, we actually have this profound teaching of the body breathing itself. Mm -hmm. We actually are not forcing our breath. And when we try to, we can do some real damage, but rather the teaching is that the body breathes itself. And the process of coming from the chaos of the mind to that simple rhythm of in and out, in and out, in and out, so that um, our mind is not devoid of thought, but we're also not consumed with thought, so that really our body and following the rhythms of our body is that which is leading us to this greater awareness. And eventually when the mind settles and we are so attuned to our bodies and the rhythms of our bodies, that's when we can start to see impermanence more clearly. That's when we can start to see our cravings more clearly. So that's really what I mean by the body as a vehicle for liberation, that it's that attunement to the rhythms of the body in which we're 
not uh, so determined or um, and especially I think in, in such a type A culture where we're so headstrong, we, we've got to do it, but, and we're all so, so muddled um, that we in this practice can see that, but we can come back to the natural rhythms of not being in control yeah. and being more attuned. Yeah. yeah, I guess, um, I mean, imagine if we had to be in control of our breath, most of us would have died a long time ago, right? <laughs> so thank goodness You're that, <laughs> you know, um, that in so many ways the earth breathes us. I think um, Thich Nhat Hanh has several meditations in which he encourages us to just feel the earth, um, feel breath breathing us, um, which is a very, very powerful, very powerful practice. Um, you know, he has this, he just had this beautiful way of saying the most profound things in seemingly the simplest ways. Um, breathe in, know that you are breathing in, breathe out, know that you are breathing out. Um, and I would also say that um, you mentioned um, Sebene Selassie. I know that she has a a four elements meditation on 10% happier, if anyone is interested in that. And that those kinds of meditations, those um, loving kindness meditation, I find to be really profound. And that uh, the four elements um, meditation, when you tap into the fact that the earth is in your body <laughs> um, in all of these different ways, I don't think that you can, there's no going back, right? Um, once you understand that you are the earth, right? We are the earth. It changes your relationship to everything. That's really beautiful. Um, and I would say too, especially in this culture, even when we try to be aware that there is no separation between the mind and the body, inevitably because of the way that we've been trained or the way that it's been ingrained, we do make this, um, I would venture to say that inevitably this separation comes up. Mm. Um, so. Very dualistic. Very dualistic, which is, I think, the exact opposite of, of Buddhism, right? No dualism. Let it right, go. Right, right. Let it go. Right. Thank you. Um, so now I'd like to, to offer a question that points to suffering. Um, so the question here says, are you saying that there is a hierarchy of suffering or culturally different suffering? And do we get to, to a place where suffering is seen as a universal condition? Hmm. Well, I think if we look at it through a Buddhist lens, that's one of the first well, of the Four Noble Truths. There is suffering. It is, it is part of the human condition. Um, so that would be... Um, my response, yeah, uh, and I know my suffering. I know my suffering as a Black woman, right, who has was born and raised in this country. Um, and I know that my experience is not my own as well. Mm. It has been shared by many, 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 many people for hundreds of years. Yeah, I think that's a very important question. And I'm especially thinking of the word hierarchy and this question of, is there a hierarchy of suffering? And what I would say is that there are very distinct forms of suffering that must be recognized if we are to skillfully approach our suffering. So I, I would personally shy away from the language of hierarchy because I think it leads us into um, waters that may not be helpful for us in navigating our own suffering. I mean, perhaps, I, I, I don't know if I can, if I'm qualified to answer that question as much as it is so important. And this is a really big part of why I wrote this book. It is so important to 
recognize that there is distinct suffering, that there are distinct forms of suffering and that we need to address those distinct forms of suffering in cultural ways, which is to say in ritualized practices that resonate for us culturally mm-hmm. and um, in very personal ways that allow us to turn towards our suffering and cultivate a sense of safety or in the language of Buddhism, a sense of refuge. It's really important that we are very clear about um, those particular forms in a collective sense. And also as we turn towards our suffering that we can name that for ourselves. So I think it's actually a yes and a yes to the different parts of that question. Yeah, thank you. So this is a very specific question um, that invites a yes or no, but certainly if um, there's more to add, please do. And um, the questioner asks, um, did you do any research with or on Black Buddhists who chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo? SGI, Soka Gakkai International. And when I mentioned at the very, very beginning that I have some critiques of this book, my own book, this book I spent five years writing, a really big part of that is that I am not well connected to SGI communities. And the vast majority of the people I accessed through really word of mouth networking are identified teachers. And in the SGI community, uh, there are many, many lay practitioners. It's the most diverse Buddhist lineage in the United States by far, the most, um, the, in terms of sheer numbers, the most uh, or highest numbers of African-American, people of African descent, broadly speaking, Latinx practitioners by far. And my book really does not directly address that. And I think it is a gap. I think um, that my lack of integration into those communities means that I didn't hear those voices so directly. I do quote um, an SGI practitioner and I do um, talk about SGI a little bit, but this is a book that primarily, (laughs) thank you for my (laughs) next book. (laughs) This is a book that primarily um, looks at, I or not looks at, lifts up the voices of identified teachers. And, and one last thing I'll say is that I do rely on some literature about SGI communities. And there's a graduate student out, in, uh, out, out at Stanford in California who's writing his dissertation on Black SGI practitioners. And I think there will be more coming out. It's really important to honor and acknowledge SGI communities. And, and again, just you know, unlike what many of the teachers I interviewed have said, SGI communities do not suffer from invisibility or culturally inappropriate or uh, repressed approaches uh, to Buddhism. It's just, it's it's an organization that really uplifts in very direct ways, cultural approaches to studying and practicing Buddhism. And so in many ways, it's a model so that said, I could speak at length <laughs> about the omission. And then, yes, I think there is room for research for sure. My next book is actually on Baldwin and Lord and Dharma. And, and that is coming out of this book. And I think there's so much to be written. There's so much importance in centering Black Buddhist voices in what we broadly call American Buddhism. Yeah, I would agree. Um, And I think that that's what's really wonderful about um, the kind of work that we do, right? We can have people who read it and say, oh, there's a gap there. Let me go and figure out um, how to fill that gap, right? And then we build upon this conversation. This is all so very new, I want to say, right? So Jan Willis is one of the first... um, Dr. Jan Willis, for me, is a pioneer in the memoir field of writing about her 
her experience as a Black Buddhist. Um, and there's been an explosion of anthologies and um, writings about uh, Buddhists who are Black. Um, I think Rima's book is the first academic um, book uh, that to come out. Um, and there will be more. Maybe some of you here will um, will be writing your own books after you read Rima's and are like, hey, I really want to um, find out more about this. And I will say too, that I think that even though, and this is, I guess, something you, you need to know outside of the, the reading, although it's not addressed explicitly, there are at least some of the people, like Reverend Zinju, for example, and I think Camila Majid, who were part of SGI. Mm -hmm. um, and so I could, I could sort of see it in there, but it could have just been because I know that <laughs> about them. But I think that that's, I think that's a really um, great question and a really great point. Mm -hmm. For sure. All right. So another question. <laughs> Do you think that there is an attraction to Buddhism and maybe not so much to Christianity because of the lack of colonialism, I'm assuming this, in Buddhist tradition versus Christianity? So one of the very, very first, it was self-published, but published writings is uh, makes that claim. It's it's um, not accessible easily any longer. Um, and the I'm, I the writer is Lama Rangdral. I think I'm pronouncing his last name correctly. I have a copy he, of that book. <laughs> oh, so do I. Yes, but I had to get emailed it as a PDF by Larry Yang. I could not find it anywhere. It was at, I mean, even trying interlibrary loan. It's a gem. So, yes. So he wrote a book. Is it called Black Buddha? Am I remembering that right? I believe so. It's a tiny yeah. little book. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a pamphlet, like mm -hmm. almost, but mm -hmm. he writes us somewhat personally. It's, I think it's published in 2001, which is the same year Jan Willis published her book, um, her memoir on being Black and Buddhist. And he makes that claim. And it was so interesting to me because I had actually never really considered that. But he said, you know, I can look at the history of Christian colonialism and the impact it has had on Black people for centuries. He said, and I don't find any association with that in Buddhism. It's, it's for me, it's a tradition in which I can entirely find myself without that history of oppression of my people. And so I think, yes, for some people, it is true that Buddhism is not something we can turn to and have personal experiences of oppression or identify with or directly identify um, with being an oppressive tradition for people of African descent, colonialism, slavery, genocide. I think there is some resonance. And I also just want to point out that that is not the case in countries in which Buddhism is a majority religion, that even today as we speak, there is tremendous oppression. So I also want to make sure that we have that caveat in mind, not, not so much a caveat, but just that awareness yeah. in mind that even if for people of African descent, we don't associate Buddhism with oppression, that many people the world over do experience that. Yeah. Um... I would add that um, for many Black Buddhists, it's not an either or as well, right? I mean, we mentioned Jan Willis's memoir, um, Black and Buddhist. She claims them both. And you'll find, uh, I believe, many Black Buddhists who have not left their Baptist traditions behind, right? Um, they haven't left their African traditions behind, you know, um, they'll have their altar and they will have, um, you know, all of these accoutrements of, of um, you know, traditional African-American religion, along with a statue of the Buddha. 
Um, and I think that that's one of the really beautiful things that uh, African people of African descent um, bring with them this ability to um, adopt and assimilate uh, these different um, spiritual traditions as a way of fully realizing our liberation, right? So it's kind of like the tools that we need, we will find. <laughs> um, I mean, think about how people um, adapted and changed Christianity to make it a liberatory practice. People do the same thing, right, with Buddhism and bring in all of these different um, all of these different elements. I would say that this is also not just true of African American religious traditions um, with relation to Buddhism, but also some of the religions that you find in the Caribbean, right? And so I think it was, um, remember, remind me of her name, Petty is her last name, wrote about the Orisha and oh, Buddhism. Cheryl Petty. Yeah. Cheryl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, right. This is how we do, right? <laughs> this is what we do. We um, take what we need in order to to find our liberation. And um, yeah, so I, I I think it's also another example of this non-dualism, right? You don't have to leave part of yourself behind in order to pick up something else. Yeah. You bring all of yourself with it to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to um, follow that up really quickly, very briefly, and mention Dr. Cohn, Dr. James Cohn, as the founder of Black Liberation Theology and as that inspiration for saying it doesn't have to be an either or. You can bring Malcolm X and Martin Luther King into the same conversation and you can see the liberatory aspects of this Christian tradition, even though it has been so oppressive. And to say that we can actually do that same kind of um, intellectual work and spiritual work and political work within Buddhism as well, that it's not an either or. Right. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the next question here is, what does faith, or does faith have a place in Buddhism? There are many Buddhist writers who would say yes, and actually you can't really do the practice without having faith, but it is not, as it is in the Christian tradition, a faith in a divine uh, God or a God incarnate. It is really faith in your own capacity to be liberated. And, and I wanna actually be very clear that it's not, that isn't quite the same thing as saying that you're liberating yourself, but faith in your capacity to be liberated. Because as we mentioned earlier in the conversation, the concept of self really goes and um, it undergoes a radical transformation when you practice on a very deep level. But that faith in your capacity to be liberated really is the motivation and the driving energy. And so it, for many people, um, it's central. Mm -hmm. And part of that liberation, right? I mean, it's waking up. <laughs> Waking up to your the causes and conditions of your suffering, right? That's that's mm -hmm. the first thing. Yeah. Just wanted to add that. It it adds a new dimension to this term woke. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. And there's a request here. Could you repeat the phrases of metta that you that you offered before? Oh, yes. So there are many different metta phrases. I actually, I don't have it next to me, but I um, want to point you to a book by Ruth King. And Tony was just mentioning Ruth. She is a really profound teacher. And the reason is that Whenever I lead metta phrases, metta practice, 
I actually use Ruth's book because uh, it's called Mindful of Race. And right in the middle of it, she has these profound, profound phrases. And she also has this way of saying, you know, this is how you can cultivate compassion for yourself. So uh, maybe a uh, piece or someone can put that into the chat, mindful of race. Um, but the phrases I used were actually the phrases that I learned initially on retreat. And the first phrase I learned is, may I be safe and protected. And, and really the first day or a few days is focused on being able to wish that for myself. And then the second phrase is towards a benefactor and it's then holding that person in front of you and wishing that same thing. May I be safe and protected. Um, another phrase is may I be peaceful and happy. Another phrase is um, may I be healthy and rested and strong. And then the last phrase that I use in my own practice that I was taught is may I live with ease and well-being. Mm -hmm. So those are the phrases. And then you wish them for yourself and uh, for a benefactor, for a neutral person, and then for someone who maybe kind of annoys you. Um, and then for someone who's really caused great harm. And that's kind of the sequence. But I, I will say that there are many different ways to do metta. And I am pointing you to Ruth's book because for me, it was important to start with those phrases on retreat. And this was, you know, I was very new in my practice, but now I'm, I don't know, 15, 16 years in. And really about two years ago, I started to work with the phrases in Ruth's book and I was able to do very deep grief work. And so I do think that finding phrases that allow you to go very deep into your emotional landscape and to really show up for whatever is there is so important for having a depth of practice. Mm -hmm. And what's so beautiful about metta is that it's compassion. It's really cultivating compassion. So, so there are phrases I started with and there are phrases I now employ um, on a daily basis and also in my teaching whenever I'm teaching groups. Yeah, I would add really briefly, because I think we're, the, the cane's about to come out, but um, I would add that, um, as, as Rima said, find phrases that resonate for you and um, take time with yourself. Um, there are people who need to do meta for, there are people who have done meta for a whole year just for themselves in order to, um, feel okay with, um, with sending loving kindness to themselves. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Um, after we have been, um, again, indoctrinated, so deeply indoctrinated with self-hatred, right? Mm -hmm. That um, sending love and compassion to oneself can be quite the challenge. It's, all, it's usually easier to send it to someone else than it is to send it to yourself. Hmm. All right, there's Greg. <laughs> well, thank you. I can't imagine a better place to end than Meta. So uh, thanks to both of you, important and impactful conversation. And I'm just very grateful that you took the time to, to be with all of us and share your hearts and, and open this up. And I can think of a thousand things I want to talk with you both about now <laughs> so so thank you and i want to thank our asl interpreters who as usual have all have just did a beautiful job and to ian reese in communications who set up sets up and promotes these events and a bottomless thanks as always to peace to sg who organizes the dharma and justice series and is the heartbeat and backbone of the Buddhism and interreligious interreligious engagement concentration and the Thich Nhat Hanh program for engaged Buddhism. And thanks to all of you, the audience. We so appreciate your showing up, your attention, and your ongoing support for this series in Union Theological Seminary. And just remember, this will be the last Dharma and Justice Dialogue of this academic year.
So um, we look forward to seeing you in the fall. And please take good care of yourselves and enjoy the spring. And thank you again for being with us and very, very grateful to you both. Heart thank is full. You, Greg, thank you. Thank you, peace. Thank you all. This was really wonderful. Be well, everyone. Thank you, interpreters. <laughs> yes. Should I ring us out with a bell? Yes. All right. Oh, sorry. I've turned my phone off. <laughs> Does anyone have a real bell? Okay, peace has a bell. Thank you all.